Hello, everyone, and welcome back to World's True Crime. I'm Brad, and with me, as always, is my beautiful fiance, Denise. Hello, everyone. So now, on our trip around the world, we're going to go to Iran. That's going to be a hard one. It is. So we're going <laughs> to put a like a disclaimer out early on that uh, the locations and people are going to be really, really hard to read. So we apologize if we pronounce anything wrong, because we are. I feel like you're setting me up for failure. This is a tough one for sure. Like I went over the names and yeah, there's a lot of translate on there. Yeah, thank you. But we got to try it out. <laughs> That's what we're here to do. But don't, do you see how you're giving me all the hard ones? I know I had an easy one last week. Mm-hmm. I probably got an easy one next week. Well, you'd be the one that uh, decides. So if you're going to give yourself an easy one. I'm going to try not to. They're, I'm just going by random draw right now. Are you now? I am actually. I'm starting to doubt that. I'll get a hard one soon. Don't worry. Okay, good. Okay, so this case here, we're going to be talking about Mohammed BJ. He was an Iranian serial killer. Mm -hmm. He was convicted of raping and killing 21 young boys between March 2002 and September 2004 and was sentenced to 100 lashes followed by an execution. Thank God for the execution. Yeah, 100 lashes though? They still do this stuff? I guess so. That is really brutal. And all these boys were between the ages of 7 and 17 years old. Yeah, they're just children. Yeah, the number of victims have been speculated to be as high as 41. Mm-hmm. So we're going to post all 41 names on the that we know of on the website. The murder of children around Tehran was recognized as the largest criminal case in Iran in the last 71 years and is strongly influenced by public opinion in the country. That's a long stretch there, 71 years before... Anything this severe has happened. Yeah, that's crazy, especially in Iran, which is like a heavily war area. Yeah. Now that the easy part's done, and let's get on to the hard part. Mohammed BJ was born February 7th, 1982 in Uchan Razavi Khorasan, province, Iran. These are going to be mouthfuls, I'll tell you that right now. Oh my God, this is so hard. And I'm so surprised too, because 1982 is still a young man when all this happened. He was 23? Very young, yeah. I think he was 23 when he was arrested or 24. Because I'm just a little bit older than him, but... A little bit? A little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah, not much, but oh, a little. Oh, no, not much at all. He's lying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this place where he was born is located on the northeast side of the country. Kind of gives you a, an idea of whereabouts in Iran it is. I know not much about Iran. Oh, really? No, not much, actually. Oh. Kind of weird. I think with um, the whole war that was going on, I was looking it up on the map and stuff and trying to find out where, like, you know, when the Gulf War was going on. Well, obviously I know where it is on a map, but I don't know anything about the like the areas in Iran. Oh, okay. Well, to be honest, I didn't know whereabouts this was until I looked it up researching. Oh, okay. Okay. Just to throw it out there. So Mohammed was the oldest of seven children. He had six full brothers, but he also had six half brothers. Unfortunately, his mother died from cancer when he was only four years old. And since he was so young when his mother died, he was left with no memories of her. His father was a merchant who remarried immediately after his wife's death. Mohammed described his father as a barbarian who beat him with a cane and chained up his legs. He even claimed his father tried to kill him with a stick. At a young age, Mohammed was forced to leave school to work. And at the age of 11 years old, Mohammed's family moved to the capital city of Katunabad? Sure. From Khorasan province, near the borders with Afghanistan and Turkmenistan, where he started working at the brickworks. Now, that's a long drive, over 1,400 kilometers or 19 hours of driving. That's a long move. It's a stretch, yeah. Yeah, it's a huge stretch. In those years, became health... Well, it is a stretch, too, because the farthest I've really moved was, like, 10 kilometers, and I actually <laughs> live about uh, 10 blocks from where I grew up. Very so true. So I don't go very far. No, you've lived in Prince George all your life. I'm, yeah, I'm happy here. And, yeah, you didn't want to move far from where you grew up, and we're probably... Eight blocks from your mom's? Yeah, and my son's going to go to the high school I went to, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, well, he went to the elementary school that uh, you went to? Yep. His last year, oh my God, off to high school. I'm sorry, we got off topic here. 
So let's go back to yeah, sorry <laughs> Mohammed. I have to say it. Yeah. Those years became hell for him because Mohammed was raped repeatedly and he often was beaten by his stepmother and said the sight of blood made him euphoric. The three squalid rooms where his family lived are now deserted. If you don't know what squalid means, it just means dirty and unpleasant. But I'm sure a lot of people know what squalid is. I had no idea. Oh, really? Nope. Oh, okay. Well, good thing that's in there. Yeah, that's exactly the reason. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good reason because okay. I had no idea. Okay. The panes of glass in the doors have long been broken by angry neighbors, revealing the bare plaster walls that were brightened by plastic flowers. That sounds plastic 80s. flowers. It does it sound 80s. Like 80s. Yeah. Yeah. A floral, yeah, one hundred percent with a floral couch and yes, uh, oh yeah. yes, we had one. Oh, we had it in mid nineties too. So <laughs> with the green or um, oh, it was, orange it was refrigerators, it was, yeah, it was orange. Oh yeah, well we, the couch was orange. Oh, well and we had orange couch too. Yeah, our refrigerator was. We white. are dating ourselves now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're not close to twenty three. <laughs> you just proved that. I am not twenty three. No, you're not. <laughs> We are old. Okay. Anyways, the home now gives off a smell of damp, musty air. On the ground was a plastic doll's head laying in disregard, long abandoned by its owner. A neighbor said, He used to sit in front of this house and look out over the brickworks. Nearby, beyond the pink stone of the brick, was a football field-sized depression. This is where in the slums most of the murdered children lived. Mohammed confessed that he planned his crimes while looking over this view. A woman from one of the Afghan families living in the small brick shack close to where some bodies were discovered said, Mohammed BJ used to walk by here and drink water from her tap. As children were playing in the mud close by, she continued on. Sometimes we saw him carrying sacks, but we never imagined there was anything bad happening. Between his observation post and a lime pit, was the location of some of the bodies that were found. At the brickwork, men, women, and even young children worked all day here. They would fill brick molds with mud and dry them out before firing them in the kilns. As soon as children were capable of filling the molds, they were capable of work. There's some major child labor going on over there. Yeah, when I was looking it up, like six-year-olds were working there. Oh, yeah, it's like easy stuff too, like brickwork? Like, come on. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, I know. Actually, I've seen a video on TV, a documentary, and they're showing um, a child doing some brick work. And yeah. it's a lot of it's work. It's a lot of work. I would not want to do brick work. Those are, they're heavy and they have to flip them over and get them out of the molds. And yeah. They, yeah. They take them out of the kilns. Like, oh my God. I would not want to do this. No. A family would only earn two pounds a week for every thousand bricks they made. For this exhausting and unhealthy conditions. So do you know how much uh, the two pounds is back then? Yeah, it's $2.69 Canadian. So for every thousand bricks, they're making $2.69. You bet. That's, I I would probably go to like the the, the labor board on that one. (laughs) (laughs) If they had that. I remember working at the nursery here, the tree nursery, and it was insane of how many trees you had to plant. That was, I think, one of my worst jobs I ever took was the the tree nursery. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot, you're doing a lot for so little pay. Right. I walked off that job. Yeah. But I had options, unlike these people that don't. There's no options. Right. The brickworks and the slums are separated by the working class in Tehran by a low line of jagged hills. So it's like this, the poor people and the richer people. Yeah, they live in different communities pretty much like where every city has them pretty much. The tall chimneys of the kilns spout plumes of dark smoke into the air, which is so polluted that nearby pine trees are turning brown. This case has also prompted a debate about the city slums and the subculture of poverty, drug addiction, and crime that has been flourished there. Still today, 40% of families in Tehran live under the line of poverty in terms of housing, and 20% are slum dwellers. There have been newspaper reports of a new plan to better organize the slums, but many local people have heard it all before, and nothing has ever been done about it. That's the same in our city, too, like with the homelessness. They're trying to move them around right now, Mm -hmm. because they're all 
they're, they're crowding their downtown core right now. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to move them somewhere where they could be safe and not in everybody's way. Right. But it's, it, they, everybody says something, but nothing ever gets done by it. Oh, that's I know. That's the issue. Yeah. Like, even the people, like, in our town, nothing's been done. No, and that happens in all over the, the world. Like, I know Vancouver is really bad for that as well. And Toronto, obviously. And, well, I'm just saying Canadian cities because we're Canadian. But I bet you New York and Chicago and all those places have the exact same uh, situations as well. Yeah. Like, we have our tent city and it's like... They're all just shoved in one area and kind of forgotten about, hoping that they're just going to disappear. But they never will. No, they're not. Not with anything, not with any lines of support to help them to right. get better or, you know, give them a safe place to live. Exactly. You have all this money going in towards, like, we have a new um, $2 fire. million dollar pool going in right yeah, now. Yeah, and then the fire station, the which fire is station was brand budget. new. Like, I mean, it's all over budget. And we could be helping these people that are downtown yeah. to get them you know, exactly. somewhere somewhere to live, a safe environment. 100% agree. And I bet you other people have the same problems. In all cities all over the mm-hmm. world is happening. Mm-hmm. And we can do something about it, but we never do. So I wish we, yeah. I wish poor people we would do something more about that. But it is what it is, I guess. We're not the ones in control. Yeah, that's right. But we have a little say here, and that's what we're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> we have a microphone. Yep. We said our piece, what we think. And I bet you all have the same ideas. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you want to let us know that, send us an email. Rolls True Crime at hotmail.com. Mm-hmm. We'd like to hear from you. Yep, we would. An Afghan woman living a stone's throw from where some bodies were found said, the police do not look after us. Only God will help us. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not all bad in Iran's capital of Tehran. There are parts that have very rich culture and you can find almost anything that you might want to purchase or do in this city. From all those palaces and historical places to bazaars and shopping centers, make Tehran one of the most lovely and beautiful places to visit or live. And I've said this before, I'd love to go visit a bazaar. Oh, I'd the market, love, the marketplace love me a bazaar. There? Oh, the marketplaces <laughs> over there? I'd love to go there. Mm-hmm. Oh, me too. They they look so huge. Yeah, there's so many people bustling around, like just like mm-hmm. trying to earn money. Oh, it's just awesome. I love that. I'd go broke there. Oh, probably me too. <laughs> oh, I, I, I definitely would. I'd be buying everything just to help them out. Even if I didn't want it, be like, ah, help them out. And then all the people there be like, oh, here comes the sucker again. I know. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Oh, well, whatever. We can go there and leave as the suckers. I'm fine with that. Yeah, me, yeah, that'd be awesome though. I'd love to see a bazaar. Yeah. What are those... Uh, Bucket list things, I think. Yeah. Should add that. So, most of these slums are along the city outskirts. Okay. So, they're not right in the core then? No. In the core is where you're going to find all the beautiful right. city, the, the culture, and the outskirts is where the poor people live. The working class, I would say. The hard working class. Yep. Blue collars. Yeah. The blue collars. That's right. In the distance is the Gamshar slums where Mohammed's accomplice... Ali Golampur, a.k.a. Bogey, lived. We'll just call him Bogey probably from now on, eh? I, I, yeah. Well, he was most commonly known. Actually, he was kind of known as both. When I looked him up, they used both names quite often. Let's call him Bogey because that's easier for us, I think. I don't know. Golampur. Golampur is actually pretty easy, too. Ah, whatever. Whatever you want. Or Ali. We'll call him Ali. Ali. Okay. God. We're going like we're tangents today. Oh my we're going God, all, yes. We're going to like eight different like places right now. Probably because we want to keep reading this because the names are so hard. I yeah. People are like, what's going on with the story right now? Yeah. Please get to the story. We'll yeah. get there. We're we're getting there. So a newspaper said that the younger man was sexually abused by his father and other men when he was a child. This that's a common that's what theme, happened. right? Yeah, that's what happened that's to both Ali. of them. Yeah, both of them. Ali had been one of Iran's one point two million heroin addicts for several years and claimed that his feelings of guilt were buried beneath the constant pangs of addiction. I didn't know there was heroin was that prominent over there. No, neither did I. Wow. Okay. New one for me. So I was completely shocked by this number. So you know me, I got to look further into this. Yeah. 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 And there seems to be a limited number of treatment centers in Iran. So there was people that went without care because of the stigma associated with drug abuse. Makes sense. Yeah. So that's why it's so high. The estimates show that two to three million of the country's population suffers from addiction. 
and 8 to 10 people die every day due to drug use. Those numbers are high. Holy. Isn't it? Yeah. I I have no idea. The average age of a drug user in Iran is 14 to 16 years old. And addiction affects people from every social class, not just the slums. I guess 14 to 16 is pretty high, actually, because I I got into drugs a little bit earlier than that. Sorry. I was just shocked because I knew, like, I know some people from back east, and they're very much into prayer, and drugs is not even a thing that they think about. So I was thinking that Iran was sort of the same. I thought they were into prayer, and drugs were... Like you're going a to no-no. hell. Yeah, yeah you're going to. They didn't, they didn't really believe in drinking either. Like right. Drinking or drugs. So. so I was so shocked by this, these numbers. Yeah, that's crazy to me. It was an eye opener. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. The initial killings were carried out once a month by these two guys. March 25th, 2002. And you know what time of that is? Movie time. Oh my gosh. I'm not looking forward to this. Uh, it's, not, it's not that hard. <laughs> 2002. Come on now. Come on now. Okay, you ready? I don't remember what I had for dinner last night. Oh, what I do. <laughs> okay. It was my birthday dinner. It was your birthday dinner. Happy birthday. Today is actually Jesus' birthday. It Just is. a little disclaimer out there. Yeah. So we're recording on our birthday. We are. Actually, we were supposed to record on Friday, but we both were just too exhausted. Yeah, so we waited till Sunday now. Yeah, <laughs> mistakes were made. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so March twenty fifth, two thousand two. Mm-hmm. So this movie, I want to say it's a it was a it's a franchise. Okay, so there's okay. many movies. Okay? okay. One of the actors, I'll, I'll start from the lower ones, but you know, and then move up. Okay. Till you get it. First one, I want to say Ron Perlman from Sons of Anarchy. Mm-hmm. Clay Morrow. He's in it. Um, is it uh, the one? Oh, one second, one second. The one that he's on fire? Not Hellboy. Hellboy. No. Okay. That's the lower actor in the movie. Okay. The next act- actor I'm going to say is Norman Reedus. Okay. And if you don't Boondock know Norman, yeah, who, if you don't know Norman Reedus, it's from Walking Dead and stuff, right? Oh, Obviously. Boondock Saints. Boondock Saints, yeah. No? No go no. so far? Okay. You might get this one now. Chris Christofferson. See, I don't know any of his movies. Okay. Okay, hold on. Let me read his. Now the star. Okay. Wesley Snipes. It's a movie about vampires. I'm seeing it. I just can't think of the name. It has five letters in it. It starts with a B. Blade. Blade 2. <laughs> <laughs> Blade 2, yeah. Blade 2 was, uh, this, uh, this was only like, it was only on for like one week. It hit it really hard in the theaters, and like they had major money. Then the second week, it just plummeted. I tried watching that last one, the Blade. What was it had the the year? Just a couple of years ago. No, we yeah we watched the whole trilogy. I think it was a trilogy. We watched them recently, but so we had to quick do a quick little pause here because Denise was <laughs> like in her head. She was thinking of Blade Runner 2049. Yeah, that's the one that we tried watching and we just could not get Yeah, into but this it. is Blade. Yeah, I know. Completely Blade, different. Yeah, totally different movies. Yeah. That one had no vampires in it. No, it did not. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that was the movie I, at the time. I think we tried watching like 10 minutes of that one and we're like, mm. Nah, I was done with it. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. I got it. You did. I did. I just needed all the actors <laughs> in five letters. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm good to go. And you still almost struggled with that. <laughs> the look I was giving you was just like, uh. There was a look. I, yeah, it's like, I hate you right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We all can uh, agree that I suck at movies. Okay, ready? Yep. Okay. So on March 25th, 2002, besides Blade, his first victim was 10 year old Ibrahim Shaboni. But in the following year, in April 2003, Mohammed started killing two to three times a month. In April alone, he killed 10-year-old Ramin Ghassami, 11-year-old Mohan Sajadi, 
and eight-year-old Ziha Alizagi. And we probably messed up a little bit of those names there, but I'm so sorry to the families. I'm trying. We're trying. We had to put. We had to say their names. We want to say their names in this one. Yeah, we do. And there's just too many names to mention. Because want to say some though, for sure. He yeah, because he was convicted for 21. Although there's up to 41. Yeah. So I mean, we just want to put some of the names out there. So and mm-hmm. try to put them out there. We want to try. We're gonna yeah. try. We don't want to. We don't want to like shy away from it either. No, we don't. Over a period of more than a year. The two reportedly lured children into the desert by saying that they were going to dig out rabbits or foxes from the burrows, but instead they were poisoned or knocked out, then sexually abused them and buried them in shallow graves in the desert south of Tehran or even burned them. They also allegedly placed dead animals near the victims' bodies to cover up the smell of the rotting corpses. It's kind of kind of smart in a way because... Like they always say, the best thing you want to do is when you bury a body, bury it eight feet deep, and put a buried dog four feet deep. But I also heard plant um, some sort of vegetation that is illegal to dig up. Oh, really? I yeah. didn't hear that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then they can't touch it. Yeah. The man nicknamed the Desert Vampire of Tehran vented his anger on 21 young boy victims over the span of two years. The youngest victims were Nazir Khorshidi, who was killed October 8, 2003, and Musad Kashmaram, who was killed October 19, 2002, who were both just seven years old. That is so young. Mm -hmm. The oldest victim was Siamak Kuhia, and still a child of himself with only being 17 years old. They call him an adult, but... That's not an adult. He's 17. He's a child still. On September 20th, 2004, before he was finally arrested, Mohammed had killed six victims at once in one day. Now, these names are going to be really hard. Adele Dashi, who is 13. Mansoor Jamali, who is 12. Iraj Bojerglu, who is 15. Mustafa Masuni, who was 10, Ramza Motaki, who was 16, and of course, who we already mentioned, Siamak Kuya, who was 17. All those children were killed in one day. Wow. And sorry about those names again, too. We tried, but we want to say them. Yeah. The killings did not come to light right away because many victims were from illegal refugee families from neighboring Afghanistan who were afraid to come forward. Other residents of the small industrial community a few kilometers southeast of Tehran are ethnic Kurds who recently migrated to the capital from the villages in eastern Iran to where their ancestors were forcibly resettled 300 years ago. Pakdish inhabitants said that they were not afforded the full protection of the law because of their poverty and ethnicity. The murderers began more than two years ago but local people said the police failed to investigate strongly enough. The case provoked national outrage in Iran. The Interior Ministry criticized the police for failing to catch the suspects after the first crime. It seems to be another case where the police failed the community yet again. Over and over again. Mm-hmm. That's what we see. Like Every time we're like in some of these certain areas, mm-hmm. it just seems like this is over. And it's the same thing over and over again. Yeah, I got tired of it, so I went and looked it up. And one of the reasons was the lack of police force compared to that of the U.S. and Canada. Yeah, I mean, we have a pretty strong police force over there. There's probably like less than a handful. Yeah, exactly. So that's why they didn't have enough people to investigate what's going on with the ongoing crimes that's happening. They couldn't afford to, you know, release those officers to investigate. Yeah, resources are probably very lacking over there. Mm Mm-hmm. The government and judiciary had opened inquiries into the handling of the case. An announcement said 16 officers had been reprimanded for their shortcomings in the tackling of the case. The judicial official further said that two policemen had also ignored calls by local people to inspect one of the murder scenes. Ferrati also said five more police officers had been arrested on charges of derailing the investigation by refusing to identify the murderer earlier 
at Tehran's Police Bureau of Investigation. He said, These five officers are now in custody and their dossiers have been completed and will be referred to the military court on Monday. Expressing hope that the police officers found guilty of dereliction of duty would be punished in proportion to their charges. An Iranian judiciary spokesman, Jamal Karimi Rad, said two inspectors, an assistant public prosecutor and Pradesh prosecutor also evidently had some shortcomings in dealing with this case. Four days after his last murder, Mohammed was arrested on September 24, 2004. When the police caught him, he was said to be watching children swimming in the canal. I've tried looking into how his accomplice Ali was caught, but I could not find anything. So if you know of how he was caught, if you're able to research it better than I can, please send us a message to put our minds at ease. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Real crime at Hobbit.com. <laughs> Just plug that in again. Yep. No, but seriously, I would really like to know how he was caught. Like, did Mohammed ride him out, which I don't think he did. Uh, I don't know. Until we know. We, yeah. There's, it's all, it's, it's all bugging me, though. Air, though. It's yeah, just bugging for me. For sure. At the time of his capture, Mohammed was quoted as saying he wanted to take revenge on society because as a child, he had been abused by his stepmother. Mohammed was tried in Branch 74 of Tehran Penal Code under the presiding judge Mansour Yivarsaide, Yigana. That's a name that we don't, don't want to keep saying, I guess. Thank you, Google Translate, for yeah. giving me the best I can get. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Oh. It's good effort. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna bow. <laughs> <laughs> when arrested, Mohammed had said that he did not deserve the death penalty. Asked if he was sorry for the crimes, Mohammed reportedly shook his head with indifference. Everybody was shocked when Mohammed said that had he not been arrested, he would have killed 100 children. Wow. He would have kept on going until he got caught. I don't think he would have ever. Yeah, I don't think he would have stopped. Well, he looked like he, when he got caught, he was at the swim canal looking for kids. Like he was looking for his was, next victim. Yeah, exactly. He was like checking them out. Like, who do I want to kill next? Yeah, he was he's ready to keep on going. Yeah. The trial only took two days. That was a quick trial. Speedy, speedy. Mm-hmm. Mohammed was calmly recounting to the courtroom the horrific details of how he kidnapped, beat, raped, and murdered one of the children. He was completely calm and free of any remorse. He gave all the gory details on how he killed his seventh victim. The family of the victim then rose from their seats and ran towards him. Then another relative of the victims began shouting and running at the accused. They wanted to kill the accused men with their bare hands. The police then quickly whisked the accused out of the court. The courtroom was a mess, and the hearing was halted. Wow, that sounds like it's like chaotic for sure. Oh, I'd be the same way. If my child was murdered, oh, I would be going for death. Oh, I, would, I wouldn't I would care. Yeah, there's this one case in the United States where um, there was a, a kid got kidnapped by his karate te- uh, teacher mm-hmm. and they were gone for days and he was, you know, sexually abused by him. And when uh, he got caught, uh, they're transferring him. And the father of the, of the victim mm-hmm. was at the phone booth, like in a little disguise. So yep. They recognized him and he pulled out a gun and shot him as he passed him right in the head. Dude, that'd be me. He took revenge. Yep. I, you There's hurt. actually a video on that yep. and you could see it all happen. You hurt my children and I don't care if I go to prison for the rest of my life. I will come after you. Yeah, that's that's crazy. That's, I, would, I would do the same thing too. My job as a parent is to protect my children and I will defend them till the day I die. Anyways. Preach. Oh, I yeah, I will preach it. They call me Hulk for a reason. <laughs> yeah. My kid's nickname for me is Hulk. Hulk smash because you get in the way of my children and... I don't have resting bitch face for nothing, man. (laughs) Okay, so anyways, back to the case. It had drawn a huge media attention with one reader writing to the newspaper asking for the alleged killers to be burned alive in a brick furnace. Why not? The prosecution and families of the victims had demanded that both men dubbed hyenas or vampires of Tehran Desert in the press to be executed. 
the two reported to have been accused of killing between 19 and 22 children, most of them young children, around the impoverished town of Pradesh, south of Tehran. Mohammed also reportedly ate a leg of one of his victims just to see what it tasted like. And of course, another one of our cases goes there. It's like they all do for some reason. Are they just hungry over there? I don't know. Initially, when I picked this case, I did not know about that, but it just came up anyway. I found that in my research, but it's I, I don't know for sure, but I found that in there. But we're going to post all the, the links of where I found information so people can look it up on our website. I want to throw that back out there again. World True Crime <laughs> at, this one's at, actually the website's worldtruecrime.com. Yeah. But if you want to get a hold of us, it's worldtruecrime at hotmail.com. Yeah, yeah, okay. Good job. Just put it out there. <laughs> the head of the judiciary in Tehran, Abbas Ali Alzadad. Alzadah. Alzadah? Yeah, Alzadah. I, I, I'd go with that. Okay, we'll go with that. Said the pair had been found corrupt on earth and would now both die for their crimes. He said they will be publicly executed at the very crime scene, but added the men can appeal within 20 days and the death penalties were subject to Supreme Court approval. On September 27, 2004, in the initial trial, Mohammed and Ali were sentenced to 100 lashes, which would be followed by execution by hanging. Mohammed BJ was handed 16 life sentences. He was sentenced to one death sentence for each murder he confessed and 100 lashes of whips for the rapes. Mohammed said in court that Ali was reluctant to join him at first and only helped him after being threatened. A retrial saved Ali from execution. For his help in the crimes, 24-year-old Ali Golampour was acquitted of involvement in the murders but was convicted for taking part in some of the kidnappings to which he confessed. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison with 100 lashes. Now, I believe that they would have been done immediately. Oh, once you leave the courtroom to start whipping them. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Gotta whip it good. Whip it. Whip it hard. Relatives of the victims greeted the verdict by throwing chairs at the defendants. As the court heard that Mohammed BJ raped many of the children before strangulation or bludgeoning them to death. When asked why he killed the children, he admitted that due to being raped, he wanted to take revenge on the community and that he suffered from his mother's early death and the lack of affection he suffered in childhood. He said, I suffered from cruelty since childhood and when I compare my life with others, I think I should commit such acts. One of the parents speaks out. Basri Shirzad, whose son was among the victims, said, I looked for my boy for nine months. After nine months, all we got was a handful of bones. Despite their frustration and anger, Basri and her husband Farrell, who were both refugees from Afghanistan, said they would have preferred to see another Islamic law. That of blood money. Instead of the execution of Mohammed as payment for the death of her son, 12-year-old Nematali, who was working full-time in the oven-making factory at the time of his disappearance. So what is like the blood money thing you're talking about here? Like, I know of blood money, but what is this like what, what does this mean? It means blood money is some sort of compensation paid by the offender, usually the murderer or the family um, as payment for losing their child. And it's like, you took my child and you get some money. So they'd rather them get money than him going in jail. That's kind of what they're saying right now. No, no, no. They're saying we'll they're go ra- in jail and we want money. They're, they're fine with him going to jail, but they wanted money instead of him, instead of him being executed. Right. Okay. They're okay with him staying alive in prison as long as they got money. Oh, okay. Hmm. I guess from being, Poor communities. They're yeah, that's what I was thinking about too. Yeah. So four families accepted this blood money for the crimes instead of demanding the death penalty. There you go right there. Okay. So four of the families took some of the money. Mm-hmm. Okay. But the death sentence was added anyways. So I kind of wish that all the families wanted the- Yeah, I wish they all got the money then for sure. But my question is, how does he come up with the money? Like, 
what if he's poor? What if he, well, he is poor, but what if he has absolutely no money? Uh, probably just sold all of his, uh, like, all of his stuff, right? Yeah. Sold all of his, um, like, property and all that kind of stuff to get any money they can, and then they just split it between them, I guess. Or maybe they found out who the parents are and went after the parents for money. Oh, probably. Maybe fa- his family, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Even though they sent him on his way, didn't want nothing to do with him, maybe they still were able to go after them. I'm glad some got money, though. That's kind of nice. Mm-hmm. I just wish that they all would have gotten it. Yeah, for sure. Sherzad said that they remembered everything in detail. We have lost everything, and my husband has a bad back, making it hard for him to work. We would have preferred some money. See, that's one of the reasons why. Yeah. He said, we have no job. It would have been better if BJ had paid money. They showed him a picture of our boy, and he told how he snatched him, and he killed him with stones, and he burned him. One father sobbed. Such crimes were not committed, even in the Serbs against Bosnians. Iran's last serial killer case ended in 2002 with the hanging of the so-called spider from the northeastern city of Mashhad. Mashhad? Mashhad, who strangled 16 prostitutes with their headscarves. That's kind of like ironic they'll be called the spider than being hanged. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's kind of fitting, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah. So, hang you in your own web. Okay. In Iran, most death sentences are carried out shortly after they are passed. Typically, the condemned are hanged early in the morning. Particularly, notorious criminals are sometimes executed in the public and at the site of their crimes. Public executions are rare in Iran, except as punishment for heinous crimes, which they performed, and also which have triggered public outcry. The government justifies them as setting an example to the population. They are never used in cases where capital punishment has been imposed by political crimes or in sentences against women. So I guess women are never hanged. Yeah, women are hanged and political probably right. prisoners or whatever too, right? Right. On March 16th, 2005, 23-year-old Mohammed would be taking his last breath. And only 23 years old, he did all this young holy. Yep. Yeah, he was just... He's bar- a child he, himself. He, yeah, he's barely an adult in taking children's lives. Yeah. In Pradesh, Iran, the town near the desert area where the killings occurred, in front of a crowd of around 5,000 people... That's like the party of the year right there, right? Eh? It is. Yeah, I have like tailgating. <laughs> <laughs> Bring some burgers. Yeah. <laughs> From the early morning, police cars drove around through the streets announcing the location and the time of the execution. Kind of reminds me of like the old days, you know, going down the streets. Bring out your dead. Yeah, bring (laughs) out your dead. Yeah, that's crazy. I don't know. That's weird. This is only 2005. Like, they're still there. It's not that long ago. It's not that long ago. At nine in the main square, they yelled into the loudspeakers and thousands responded to these calls. Soon, the square was full of people, women, men, young and old, gathered behind a fence built for the occasion. At times, they would try to push their way through it, as well as the human chain of policemen that surrounded the place of the execution. Bunches of young boys dangled from trees and lampposts, and dozens of people crowded the roofs of surrounding buildings. In the middle of the square stood a tall crane, that would be used for the execution. Spectators had even climbed into the tree to get a better look. Just meters away from it, relatives of the victims waited for the police to bring out the man who had murdered their children. Mohammed's public execution was in sharp contrast to his trial, which was held behind closed doors. This was a measure that authorities said was justified to spare the victims' families further pain. Mohammed's shirt was removed, and he was handcuffed to an iron post. Spectators were held back by barbed wire. About a hundred police officers chanted, Harder! Harder! as officials took turns to flog Mohammed's bareback before his hanging. He fell to the ground a couple times during the punishment, but did not cry out and remained calm and silent the entire time. Some in the crowd even threw stones at Mohammed as he was being flogged. That's like... 
insult to injury. He's getting lashed. You're throwing stones at him. I wouldn't care. There's a crane right there where he's probably looking straight at where he's about to like. These people have lost their children. Oh, no, 100%. I'm just saying like, I mean, 100 lashes is a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that tear his back right open. Oh, it would, yep. I'd give him the old blood eagle. What's that? Oh, yes. From Vikings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a 17-year-old brother of Rahim Younesi, who was one of his young victims, managed to get past security and stabbed him as he was being punished before police dragged him away. Okay, so he got lashed, stabbed, rocks thrown at him, and he's staring at the crane that he's about to be, like, hanged from. This is the, this is not a good day for him. <laughs> this is not a good day for him. But I like... He, he deserved it. I 100%. like today. Yep. Malad Kahuni, one of the victim's mothers, put a blue nylon rope around his neck and he was hoisted about 10 meters in the air by the crane and slowly throttled to death in front of the crying crowd. So they kind of like bounced him. Yeah. The sobbing mother of another victim said, I could not recognize my son after what this murderer did to him. Hanging by a crane is a common form of execution in Iran. It does not involve a swift death as the condemned prisoner's neck is not broken. Yeah, because back in the old days, they'd drop that door. Right, you would, would slam. You slam, and then your neck would break, and that's how you would die. That's not really being uh, like uh, suffocated to death. Yeah. It's more your, your neck being broken. This year, you're being suffocated to death. Exactly. This took more than five minutes for him to choke to death while he was being taunted and spat at. So we want to add the spitting too. Knife, rocks, lash, spit, and a hang. And a hang. One bereaved father shouted, dance and think about what you did to our kids. Some people burst into tears, crying out the names of their dead children. Some shouted, shame on you, BJ. Others chanted, Marge Bar BJ, which means death to BJ. I probably butchered that. Uh, just a disclaimer, if she butchered that, let us know. World's True Crime at <laughs> I'm going to come across this desk and I'm going to stab you. <laughs> As Mohammed's body squirmed in midair, Ali Kashravi screamed the name of his son, 12-year-old Kavan, who was murdered with two of his friends after being abducted outside the family home. As Ali held tightly onto his 8-year-old daughter Sarah's hand, watching the execution. Sarah's like the easiest name we've had so far. Oh, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I love your name. Ali shouted to the crane crew, turn him around. Make him swing. When they obliged, Mohammed's body swung from side to side, causing both his shoes to fall off. Ali exclaimed, This is my happiest day. It makes up for the day my son was killed. My boy and his two friends were playing tag outside the house when BJ tricked them into going with him by using some story about hunting animals. He took them into the desert and killed them. We never recovered Kaven's body. All we got or some bones. After about 20 minutes, the body was lowered and a doctor confirmed Mohammed's death. Many in the crowd, some of them were family members of the victims, repeatedly tried to approach Mohammed's body, but were prevented by riot police. Scuffles continued for about half an hour. Many of the people in Pradesh supported the hanging. Zara Kalegi, a resident, said, Public executions Reduce the occurrence of offenses. BJ destroyed many families. He deserved more than death. Yeah, he got 100 lashes, stabbed, <laughs> rocks thrown at him, and he got spat on. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing to add. <laughs> oh. But Dariash Maribon said public hangings only promote violence. Dariash also witnessed the hanging and said, Many criminals have been hanged, but offenses have never reduced. It is an ugly scene that a human being is hanged even if he has committed many crimes. Revenge is not the solution. Convicts are hanged in public in Iran only if a court deems that their offenses deeply affected the public sentiment. Iranian courts are controlled by hardliners. What's a hardliner? I looked that up because I wasn't sure. I knew you did. That's why I asked. I always have to look things up. A hardliner is a member of a group, uh, typically a political group that adheres to a set of ideas or policies. 
Okay. So Iranian reformists say that public executions hurt the country's international image and reflects badly on Islam. One senior court official defended the decision to hold the execution in public. He said minutes after Mohammed's hanging, look at the way the emotions of the people have calmed down. We had to hold it in public. Holding a photograph of his murdered nine-year-old son, 49-year-old Mohammed Nuri, an Afghan refugee, thanked Iran for administering justice to Mohammed BJ. He said, Today's execution will reduce my suffering. I am satisfied with the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Iranian people. So that does it. That guy was hanged and everything done to him. Well, he, he, he 100% deserved he it. He deserved it. Killing children. Um, like, oh, I wish that his accomplice got a little bit more, too, because when he had 15 years and 100 lashes, like he should have been sentenced to to. I think, hanged. yeah, I think he should have had the same outcome. Oh, it should have been yeah. for sure, 100%. Yep. So what are you going to rank him at? Oh, it's going for a 10. He killed children. He did. Yeah, he did. He lured them. He he didn't just grab a child. He preyed on them. Yeah, he was praying. He was like, like when he got caught, he was at the pool praying for another one. Yeah. He is a predator. Yeah. And he even said that he would continue for so 100, 100, 100 yeah, yeah. children. So definitely a 10. This guy, I have no sadness for his execution. I am thankful for it. And I don't care that somebody stabbed him, a parent, or no, it was a brother, stabbed him. They just had a whole bunch of kids sitting on there spitting on him. Oh, imagine if the oh, kids slashed him. But that would be really traumatic for children. Yeah. But, I mean, you're watching a guy get hanged on a crane <laughs> as a child. So. All these kids watching this. It just brings me back to the old days where hangings happened and all the kids were around watching it. It's like the same kind of thing. Yeah. To me, seeing this as a children would help prevent them to become like him. Yeah. I mean, he believed a lot of this stuff on his upbringings and his stepmother stuff, but he didn't have it, to do this no, stuff. No, it's your choice in life. Everybody goes through rough life. Like, you know, not everybody goes through a rough life, but like some, some people go through a rough childhood and they surpass right. and they overcome it i i've had abuse happen to me as you know yep and i would never ever consider murdering somebody ever just me just you <laughs> we gotta edit that out nope I'm giving it <laughs> it's on record <laughs> son of a bitch <laughs> <laughs> so so you know we're gonna go to our next case no I got a good one, I think. I I really like it, and I want to go to France. Oh, comment ça va? I took German in high school. Oh. Um, I just asked Sabien? Sabien? Is that, is that something? You're doing good? Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Delicio? Delicio. <laughs> you going? <laughs> Was that Italian? It's Italian. Okay, we're not going to Italy? No. <laughs> we did Italy. Okay. Okay, French. Uh, Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? C'est soi. <laughs> I don't know who it is. I just know the song. Will you go to bed with me? Oh, well, we yeah, we usually do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's yes. let's end this. I think okay. it's time to say goodbye to people. So, what we'd really like is some reviews on Apple Podcasts. We had a couple. They're awesome. We want to thank oh, you guys. Thank so you guys much. so much. Yeah, we it's, really appreciate right that. our day when we see that stuff. Oh, as soon as we seen it, we were smiling from ear to ear. We we're just so and yeah. Happy. I was like, I showed her, and I was like, she's like freaking out a little bit because it was kind of awesome to see. It's so nice. Yeah, so thank you so much. Great reviews are awesome. That's all we really care about. Just so we know that we're like, you know, we're doing stuff that are making people happy. And if we're not making people happy, send us an email at worldstruecrime at hotmail.com and let us know what can make it better for you. We wanted to have a couple of shout outs. One was to Bethana. And I'm pretty sure that's from True Crime B&B. Which we adore. Yes, we do. Yeah, so if you haven't heard about them, you're missing out. Yeah, there are, we did a promo with them. You can hear us one of our earlier episodes. But yeah, True yeah. Crime Being Me are awesome. I listen to them all the time. Like every time I'm like, I got yeah, you're mowing time. the lawn. I was mowing the lawn this <laughs> last one. And I loved it. It was so good. I was like, I was so happy. Yeah. When I pick up uh, our son from school, I have it like blasting in the vehicle. I'm sure that people don't appreciate that me sitting at the school. 
listening to true crime. Yeah, I've listened to all their episodes, yeah. like, but I'm driving around. They're awesome. I yeah. love them. And another one was Passion Board Shop. So thank you, thank Passion Board Shop. Thank you so much. Shop. It brings yeah. our day up. It does. And we could really use ratings and reviews because it helps us get seen because we want to keep doing this. And yeah. we, like, we like doing this kind of stuff. We do. I mean, we're not going to stop, I don't think. But we're going to be just like the reviews. You can't make us leave. No, we just like doing it. <laughs> we do. Plus, it's something for me to do. I was in a car accident, so it gives me something to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, she can't go to work right now, so no, or maybe ever again. So uh, we're just gonna be doing this. So I can't just sit at home and eat bonbons. So get like really, really big. (laughs) (laughs) Although I do like bonbons. Okay, well, we're gonna say goodbye now. Okay, we appreciate (laughs) all of you. Rants on this one. (laughs) Yeah, and this is Denise's birthday, so we're gonna go 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 buy some flowers or something. I want to go to the flower shop. Yeah, go get some flowers to plant. Yeah. Okay, you guys. Just remember, the world's not always as it seems. No, it's not. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye.